from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Second of two panels on our Congressional Oral History Symposium entitled Jack Kemp and the Reagan Revolutionaries in the House. Um, it's co-sponsored by the Jack Kemp Foundation and the Kluge Center for Scholars at the Library of Congress. We're at the Whitall Pavilion at the Library of Congress. Today is March 6, 2012. I'm Morton Kondracki, holder of the Jack Kemp Chair in Political Economy at the Kluge Center. Um, the panel is, we've rearranged from the morning, Vin Weber, um, who uh, served with uh, Jack Kemp from uh, 1980 to 1989. Trent Lott, uh, who was um, the House Majority Whip and served with Jack Kemp from 1972 to 1989. Fred Barnes, who covered him uh, for the Baltimore Sun, uh, the New Republic, and the Weekly Standard. Uh, Bob Livingston, um, who uh, was uh, with Jack from 77 to 89. Connie Mack, as we I uh, remember this morning was uh, came to Congress in 1982, um, and Al Hunt, um, who, as I said, uh, covered him for the Wall Street Journal. Um, Trent Lott and Al Hunt were not here this morning, so I'm going to pose some questions to them that I that I posed to everybody else. Um, let me ask uh, Senator Lott, what, uh, how would you characterize uh, Jack Kemp's role in the Reagan, Reagan Revolution, and what impact do you think he had on? <coughs> conservative thinking in the United States? Actually, he was the spiritual leader of what became the Reagan Revolution. Uh, a lot of people uh, don't realize that uh, it really began in the House, uh, probably uh, in the mid-70s, maybe 1978, uh, when Jack kept telling us, look, we've got to change our message. Uh, we're all talking about root canal politics. You know, you've got to cut this, you've got to reduce that. And that sort of led to the language uh, of, uh, you know, opportunity and growth and, you know, the Kemp-Roth bill, supply-side economics. Um, I have to say here, too, that uh, Newt Gingrich was uh, an important part of that. He was part of the, the wordsmithing that, uh, you know, uh, we used, uh, or ch we changed our language. But Jack also, uh, I'm sure it's been mentioned earlier, I mean, he, he was one of the people that said, you know, uh, he believed in conservatism with a smile, not a growl, not a snarl. Uh, and uh, so it, uh, it began uh, in the 70s in the House. Uh, and, of course, then the Reagan Revolution uh, continued that. But, uh, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that a lot of the ideas that uh, President Reagan used in his campaign uh, in the late summer and the fall came out of that House group. A lot of people, including... Uh, then Congressman Carol Campbell went on to be governor of South Carolina, Henry Hyde. We had a group of about 30 of us, but Jack was really our spiritual leader. Um, and then, uh, of course, uh, when the President Reagan was elected, uh, then we started implementing it. But it didn't really culminate until we eventually won the, the, the Senate and the House. And then, of course, in 2000, uh, we uh, won it all, the House, the Senate, and at that point, and the White House. Um, Without Jack being prominently involved, I think uh, one of the problems we got into is we, uh, we kind of ran out of gas once we achieved uh, the Kemp-Reagan revolution. But no, there's no question that it began with Jack in the House in the mid-70s. Yeah. Uh, Morton, I, I recently did a, a column on the, the fact that all the presidential candidates now, the, the one thing they will guarantee recite 17 times in a speech will be Ronald Reagan. That's the one name that they invoke. It's like the Democrats used to be with F FDR. And um, so I called a bunch of Reagan people, uh, Lou Cannon, who wrote the, uh, the, uh, the book on, on Reagan and covering for so long, Jim Baker and others. Uh, and one thing they all said was that the, the, the member of Congress that Reagan probably either talked about the most or most influenced him was easily Jack Kemp. And uh, as a reporter in the late 70s, I, I came to believe in the early 80s, I came to believe that if, if supply side economics, whatever its merits are not, if it had had a different face, it would have had a different outcome. It was Jack Kemp's optimism that Trent uh, you know, alluded to a minute ago. It became a can-do thing to make, to lift all boats rather than a let's just cut taxes so rich people and business people can do well. Uh, and I think no one conveyed that message 
as as well as as uh, as Jack did, and you know I remember covering Reagan in '76 and '77, '78, and and Reagan was certainly a conservative. He was not really a supply sider, and I think Jack Kemp uh, played a huge role in, um, in 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 turning Reagan into a a a, a more devout supply sider. So when did you first meet Kemp? In the mid '70s. Uh, probably 73 or 74, uh, and um, uh, you know, it was it was by the late 70s I had formed I think a pretty close friendship with him. You know, he would I think I told you the story earlier. Jack used to love to go in front of groups, and particularly if we were out in Vail, Colorado, it would be a bunch of wealthy businessmen. And he'd say that I want you to meet Al Hunt because he thinks all problems of the world will be solved if you just paid more taxes. Uh, so uh, I think we developed a very good social social relationship, but I love to cover him because even when I disagreed with him, I found Jack such a compelling figure and such a, uh, uh, Jack was authentic. Uh, there, were, there were things that uh, Jack didn't have as much discipline as some other people in the business, uh, and there were some gaps, I'm sure, but Jack was, I've never met a more authentic person than, uh, than in politics than Jack Kim. Trent, what, what, when did you first uh, get associated mm -hmm. with him and how? And then how did your relationship develop? It was well, obviously very close. Some, I know we've talked a lot about uh, Jack and supply-side economics, but there's a lot of other uh, sides of, of Jack that I think are just as interesting. He also had a sense of humor. And I used to razz him about his football playing, and uh, I first started paying attention to him when he was playing for the Buffalo Bills, and I thought he was the slowest quarterback I'd ever seen. And he, and he seemed to have big feet. So I, <laughs> I, I, I'd tell him that, and he would respond, yeah, well, you were a cheerleader. I said, yeah, and a lot of times I spent more time on the field than you did playing quarterback. But, I mean, we would banter back and forth like that. And, of course, I met him, um, I, I guess, when he, I, he first came to the House, I guess, in 1970. I was uh, administrative assistant to a Democrat, chairman of the Rules Committee, uh, Bill Calmer. And I, by then I had uh, become a, a fan of Jack Kemp and, and Bill Archer and uh, Phil Crane. And when time came to run for Congress, um, I ran as a Republican. And so, and then when I came in in, in 1973, uh, Jack and, and Bill Archer, uh, you know, kind of became my mentors. Kind of took me under their wing and encouraged me and pushed me. And, and Jack used to give me great lectures about how Republicans had to reach out to you know minorities and and to labor unions. And he found out that my dad was a pipe fitter union member. He said, you know, you ought to, you ought to work those, uh, those members. You ought to go to the union halls. I actually did that. I'd actually go to the union halls, like I know Bob Livingston did, take my coat rating, which was about 10 or zero, and I'd go down the, the list and ask the members in the union hall. I remember doing this at the Carpenters Union Hall. Would you vote it for that? And the answer was no. But Jack pushed me to do that, and he pushed me to reach out to groups that uh, in my state of Mississippi that Republicans weren't expected to reach out to. It made a huge difference in my life um, and uh, in, in my politics, too. But uh, Jack also, we had a, we had a, a, a bond uh, a, because of our faith. Uh, were, he was also a, a very committed uh, a Christian. And uh, we had some times when we uh, had difficulties and we would get together and discuss those difficulties in that in that vein. Um, so what, um, uh, I, w I forgot to ask you all this, uh, this morning, so, uh, which, so everybody can answer, beginning with Vin. So what do you think were the outstanding personal characteristics of Jack Kemp? Yeah, high energy, relentless <laughs> optimism, intellectual curiosity. Uh, boy, uh, uh, that, I, I guess I could go on and on, but that's what I'd say most comes to mind, just uh, this incredible energy and intellectual curiosity, and, and, and never has heard a discouraging word. I want to just make another point. Yeah. He, we talk about supply-side economics a lot as if Jack became a national leader because of supply-side economics. I remember the first time I met Jack Kemp. I was a staffer here after the 1974 elections, and there weren't very many Republican staffers who came out with newly elected members then, so we were all kind of hanging together. And I remember standing in the Cannon Caucus Room, 1975, or not Caucus Room, by the elevator. And the other, ele we're talking to three or four Republican staffers. And the elevator came open and out came Jack, surrounded by all sorts of people. I didn't know who he was. So I said to these other people, who's that? They said, 
That's our leader after Reagan. This was the uh, young Republican staffers in 1975 before we'd ever heard of supply side economics. I'm not going to dwell on it, but I wanted to make that point. Jack was seen, maybe not as, maybe we didn't have supply side economics, but by a whole generation of Republicans, he was seen as the next leader. These were members? These were the staffers. Staffers. Young staffers. Fred? Jack was also, uh, you know, consistent. And uh, I remember he got me in trouble with Reagan one time because he, uh, on his tax policy, he did not like the 1986 tax reform package. He thought it was a tax increase. And uh, I uh, kind of agreed with him and, and made it known that I was, as a whip, I was not going to support it. And I wound up in, in the Oval Office uh, with President Reagan saying, well, Trent, if I can't count on the whip, who can I count on? And I was thinking at the time, I'll never forget it, you know, Jack Kemp got me into this. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember having to work him sometime to get him to, to, to vote on some issues. And, uh, you know, he had just such an effervescent personality, and I do think that the intellectual curiosity is a good term, too. Uh, he, was, he was always exploring ideas. He was an ideas man, no question about it. And that's something I think uh, Republicans uh, need to return to. We need to come up with some more ideas about how we uh, preserve this great young republic and how we go into the future promising the people we're going to make a difference for them. Fred? Well, he did have a dynamic personality, and it was uh, overpowering in, uh, in, in, uh, in so many cases. But, you know, he, had, he also had something else. It wasn't just that he had intellectual curiosity, which he did, but he had mastered uh, the subject matter of economics, of tax cuts and, uh, and all the ramifications of that. He had great people working for him. John Mueller's here is one. Uh, but he had mastered it, so he, he, had, uh, he could answer all the questions. Bob? Something Trent said about his sense of humor. Uh, uh, despite all of his, uh, his great attributes, he didn't take himself too seriously. He, he had fun, and uh, I can remember after we were all gone, there was a gathering of us, and I think it was uh, Vin and Newt, uh, Dan Lundgren, and I believe Trent. And Jack walks in, and looks at the gathering, he says, my goodness, this is only about eight years ago. He says, what a group of has-beens. <laughs> <laughs> Connie Mack? Well, um, the first thing I wrote down was presence. Uh, when he walked in, there was something about the guy that just drew you to him. Um, charisma, however one wants to define, define that. And when you have that, um, that, that gives you opportunities to do other things, um, he clearly was a leader. He was an educator. Um, how many times would he come up to each of you and say, have you read this? Did you read that book? Um, I did catch him one time. There was a book called Microcosm. George Gilder had written it. And, it was, and so Jack had said to me, have you read this book? And I, I hadn't read it. So I went out immediately and bought it. I read the whole damn thing. And it was the, it was the most boring, dry <laughs> book except. I believe the introduction was the most optimistic, challenging um, uh, things that I've so I, I went, this is when he was down at, at HUD, and I went down to, <laughs> to be with him for a few minutes down, and he had just gotten in. You talk about a fellow that looked like he was absolutely lost. He was the only person on, on that top floor, a couple of people ar around him, and nobody else. And I started into this conversation about this book, Microcosm. And I kept getting these kind of blank looks about these various things that I had read in there. And then it dawned on me, the only thing he had read was the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> but he convinced me it was worth reading. Did he write the introduction? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he would have loved it. Um, but, he, but he constantly was doing, uh, you know, encouraging to read. I mean, he was a person who was driven by ideas. And as we've all kind of implied, um, you know, we need to get back to that. Uh, he was very inclusive. Um, and as Ben said, I probably could go on and on. But those are the kind of things that come to my mind when I think about it. Yeah. Well, I would agree with what everyone has said, and I would add, uh, when I think of Jack Kemp, uh, I also think uh, race. Uh, I uh, have never met anyone who was as committed as Jack Kemp was to uh, racial equality. Um, you know, the old line, I forget who was the first person. Several people get credit for it, that Jack has showered with more African Americans than some politicians have met. But it was, it was such a genuine commitment. Uh, when I was at the Wall Street Journal, we had a wonderful reporter in uh, Chicago named Alex Kotlowitz who wrote a great book called There Are No Children Here about the horrible life and the, and the tenants out there and what a mother went through with her children. And uh, right as the book came out, Jack 
I got a call from Jack one day. Uh, he was HUD secretary then, who said, uh, uh, give me Alex Kotlerwich's phone number. And I said, well, I'll get it for you. I started asking questions. He said, no, I want Alex Kotlerwich's phone number. I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> uh, and he immediately got in touch. It was, so, it was so genuine. He cared so passionately about it. And it was an issue that I think he, uh, uh, he made a big difference in. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I asked everybody what their standout moment experience with Jack Kemp was, what was yours? Well, there's so many I wouldn't have, and even a few I can tell. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to tell one story that never has been told before because uh, and it, was, it was very revealing about Jack. When Jack was running for president in 1987, I belonged to this political writers group. It was hack political writers is what we really were. We were people who really, I mean, I mean we couldn't get through, we know how to spell George Gilder, much less how to read the book. But we covered campaigns, and we had a theory that you could have off-the-record dinners with candidates because you got to see them a lot, a lot more than now. And so, therefore, it was this was Jack German and John Chancellor and Bob Healy and the like. And we had Jack, and he brought Ed Rollins, who was his campaign manager. And we were, this was in the aftermath of Iran Contra, and uh, it was off the record. Now, I'm going to violate that now, but I figure after 25 years, even Jack wouldn't mind if I did that. And at one point, uh, Jack said, um, look, I can understand why Reagan did that. I mean, there's a humanitarian issue here. And, I can, and Ed Rollins said, no, you can't. And, and Jack said, oh, yeah, I can. And Ed Rollins said, no, you can't. <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> and, he said, and they really argued for about two or three minutes. It, it showed a couple things. Uh, I mentioned earlier, there sometimes was a lack of discipline with, with, with Jack, and that was an issue that if it ever come out, if it had come out publicly in 1987, it would have been the end of his campaign, probably, because it was, I mean, Reagan apologized for it. But it also showed his, his real genuine humanitarian <laughs> side. He wasn't saying he would have done it. He said, look, if there are people who are in terrible trouble, I can see why you would do things like that. It was a wonderful Namely moment. Namely the Contras. Pardon me? Namely the Contras. Yes. He could understand why you would sell arms to the Iranians in order to help the Contras. Well, or in order, no, this was in order to get the prisoners out, uh -huh. the, the people who were being held hostage over there. That, remember, that was the yep, issue. Yep, the Reagan right, right. swap arms in order to get hostages out. And, uh, and I, again, I, don't, I want to be fair to Jack. He never said he would have done that. He just said, I can really understand, which was not a, political, a politically correct answer that time if you were running for the Republican presidential uh, nomination, but it, uh, but, it, but, but it was him. But the fact that uh, his campaign manager kept saying, no, that's not what you think, and he said, yes, that is what I think. <laughs> <laughs> Trent, what? what? What's your outstanding personal memory? You know, I, I don't know that there was uh, an event uh, that I remember specifically, but one of the things I was thinking about, Jack, uh, too, was the, just the number and the variety of friends he had and how loyal he was to them. Uh, you know, he stayed in touch with his friends over the years, and he and, and Joanne and Trish and I went to, as I recall, maybe a couple of Super Bowls, and. I'd run into uh, people that he played football with in San Diego and Buffalo and watching their attitude toward him and how he kept those friendships uh, over all the years, even though you know he hadn't played football since the, the 60s. But also, uh, Jack did have uh, an awareness of what his limitations were. I remember uh, when uh, in the House, uh, Jack was chairman of the conference. But when there was an effort to get him to run for whip or, or maybe even leader at some point, he wasn't interested in that. Uh, he, he was more interested in the ideas of the legislation rather than, you know, trying to, you know, count votes or to you know, get out there and, and be on the point every day. He was a very critical point, a part of our leadership, but he, he, uh, he had a higher agenda, frankly, than just the, the leadership in, in the House. Okay, so uh, I, I said that this is not going to be entirely hero worship. So, w what would you say were his foibles or his flaws, Vin? Well, I'll, I'll talk about the 1988 uh, presidential campaign a little bit. Um, I don't know if this is a flaw. It's a flaw in a candidate. Let's say that Jack had a real intense aversion to being controlled by anybody else. And I worked with a lot of presidential candidates, as most of us at this table have, and it's always a little hard because you turn yourself over to a group of other people and they tell you, go here, go there, say this, say that. But Jack had more trouble with that than anybody I ever knew. I mean, he really, really resisted having anybody else take control of his schedule or his life in any way. And at one level, I, you know, I, at one level, I suppose that can sound like hero worship too, because we all like to be independent. 
but as a candidate for president, it was a flaw. It made it, it, made it difficult. Uh, and I think that that showed in the, in, uh, the lack of debate prep, because he wasn't going to be told how he was going to prepare for the debates. Um, and this in some other things. 1996. And that for, yeah, you're right, 96. 88 was when I had actually more involvement with him. Same thing was true in 88. Same thing was true in 88, pretty much. In 88, I, I, I just remember, I, again, this is, this is not, this is a criticism, but in the way I admire it. We, we, we were basically out of the race, and we had to go down for the South Carolina primary one last stand. And if you, at that time, they had officially abandoned the goal of the 600-ship Navy that Reagan had, had articulated when he first ran. And Ed Rollins and I and a bunch of us said to Jack, look, we don't, we're, we're, in, we're in tough shape. We were really out of the race, but we didn't know it. Go in and make South Carolina primary all about maintaining the 600-ship Navy goal, because it's the biggest naval state in the country. Make it a single-issue campaign, sort of like Reagan did the Panama Canal in North Carolina in 1976. And Jack said, yeah, yeah. So he went down to South Carolina and, and gave speeches about SDI. But in his mind, in his mind, SDI was what really mattered. And the notion that, you know, we had to win the damn primary in South Carolina was not what went through his mind. He, he knew what he thought was important. And that's what he was going to talk about. And nobody was going to tell him otherwise. I, I just have to agree with that. Uh, there was a certain amount of uh, you know, lack of discipline sometime. And also, I think, uh, sometime he, he got out on issues uh, from a political standpoint uh, that uh, you know, could be uh, damaging, but yet he believed so passionately. It was an, it, actually, it was a tremendous asset uh, uh, and it made him very attractive. Uh, uh, I hate to bring up a particular issue, but I'm sure Jack would not, be, would not like where we are positioned now on, on immigration, for instance. Uh, and I remember him giving some speeches about all oh, these are God's children, and they're, that's the most valuable resource you can have, is human resources. And uh, that was, that's what made uh, Jack so, so lovable and so inspirational. It also was uh, sometimes a problem from a, a pure, for the leadership, politically. I, I heard a story, by the way, um, that concerns you, see if it's true or not, <clears throat> that, uh, that he was going to go to Mississippi and you said, now Jack, talk about anything you like, but let's not talk about how we want to have blacks, you know, back in the big time in the Republican Party. So Jack goes down there, makes a speech, and that's exactly what he talks about. Absolutely. <laughs> well, what, what, it, it, what was the event? Oh, I don't know. I probably had him come in and speak to, I don't know, maybe it was, uh, it, it could have been a state JC uh, meeting or it could have been a state party uh, meeting, but he got rave reviews. And nobody else could have said what he said and, mm. and gotten the reaction that he got. So, that was, you know, so what your so your fears were not. Fulfilled. No, you know, look, it was you know it's still difficult uh, in in some states in those days to say what he was saying and thinking, but he said it in such a way that it just made so much good sense and so much of a fairness content to it that it didn't it didn't cause a, it. Not only did it not cause a ripple, it was well received. Fred Foibles. You know, after covering Jack Kemp so much and uh, sitting through. So many speeches, <laughs> probably more. Al's probably the only person here who's sat through as many Jack Kemp speeches, and uh, and they did go on. You know, maybe <laughs> that <maybe, laughs> <maybe, laughs> length. At length, you know, and you could always spot. You could always spot the uh, the perfect end point. You know, you can spot it when preachers on Sunday when they when they <laughs> ought to end, and and they frequently don't end either. But uh, uh, it you, you'd get pretty weary. Uh, you know. Maybe running for president was a mistake, although it was the logical next step uh, politically uh, for Jack Kemp. It is something, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan let handlers do a, a whole lot. Uh, that was one of the secrets to his success. Right. He, he cared about the speeches, and they were all a certain length. Uh, but you really do have to be disciplined. And, and, and that kind of discipline for, for Jack Kemp, who believed so strongly in so many things, uh, and he wanted to talk about all of them in, every, in, in one speech or another, and sometimes in, all in one speech, uh, um, and that wasn't a recipe for getting to the White House. And that, and that played out in the debate uh, uh, when he was running with vi for vice president uh, with Bob Dole. Uh, he was on Meet the Press and had specific questions, gave specific answers, and, and hit it over the uh, fence uh, that Sunday. And the debate against Al Gore was that Tuesday. 
and uh, it was just like night and day. Uh, he could generalize and get away with it on Meet the Press, but in the debate against Gore, it did not work. He tried to resort to his rhetoric about uh, the gold standard and supply-side economics, but the questions were far more specific and targeted to other areas beyond uh, his field of expertise. And uh, as Trent and Ben have pointed out, he didn't, uh, uh, he, he wasn't going to be controlled about what he could say, and it ended up showing up well, in that supposedly debate. He, supposedly he didn't prepare. He, yeah. I mean, I've heard that, that he played tennis all day that day. I, think that's, <laughs> I don't know for a fact, but it, 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 it appeared that way in, in the debate. I think that Judd Gregg uh, was his um, debate partner uh, in, in 88. And so they did some of it, but... No, uh, that, no this 96. was 96. We're talking I mean, about in 96. I'm sorry, in 96. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they did. They but, did. Okay. But I just re I would like to recharacterize this business about discipline. I mean, Jack was disciplined. He knew what he wanted to talk exactly. about, yeah. and he yeah. talked about it. Uh, he, it just sometimes didn't coincide with the uh, uh, the hour of the day. Let me jump in day. on that. You know, you don't want this to just be a you know a total admiration society, but uh, I don't think I've known anybody else in Washington that by the sheer force of his personality, his will, and his ideas, moved as many people around from uh, politically, from positions they had held or from not having any positions to become disciples of Jack Kemp. I mean, he really had a huge impact on a whole generation of us that served with him. Al, well, any foibles besides? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, uh, <laughs> I, I, um, I had sat through a lot of those speeches, and I still thought, uh, I, and I'll tell a story about this, that I still thought Jack Kemp had a, a real shot in 88. I thought he really was so much more the future than either Bush or Dole. And I was dumb enough to, when the Washingtonian Magazine called once to say who's going to be, the, what'll be the ticket in 88 to predict Jack Kemp. And I was later with my wife and child at the actually Final Four basketball thing in Dallas and George W. Bush, who was still drinking in those days, came up and let me know in no uncertain terms about what a dumb son of a bitch I was. Um, and I was. <laughs> uh, but I remember Fred in, in, at one New Hampshire event in, in 1988 where Jack said, you know, they all tell me, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to talk about the gold standard because they tell me that that's crazy. You can't talk about it. And then he spent 35 minutes talking about the gold standard. <laughs> and nobody had the slightest idea what he was talking about. They didn't have the slightest idea except Jack. Uh, <clears throat> and <clears throat> I went and more after that, we had dinner I don't know, two or three years after that campaign. I guess he was HUD secretary or it was out in Vail. And I said, Jack, <clears throat> do you have regrets about that? Because it was a real, no, it was actually later than that. And I said, do you have regrets about it? And he said, regrets why? I said, well, it didn't turn out terribly well. And he said, you know, I, I don't know if Judith is still here. He said, uh, when I, my boys were growing up, I went to all their football games. And he did. I mean, Jack Kemp never missed one of their games. And he said, we spent a lot of time together in that. I love my daughters just as much, but I didn't spend as much time. And I spent so much time with my daughters in that campaign. How can you possibly regret it? And I thought, what a wonderful human story that is, rather than, you know, how he finished. And just a final sequel to the Al Gore thing, it was awful. It was a terrible debate. And we were, again, in Vail that Christmas. And, um, and we, we had a bunch of people over. And Gore was there. So we invited Gore. And Jack came, and Gore came. And everybody was there was stunned because there was this incredibly warm, they were chatting, and they were even arguing and bantering. And I assure you, it wasn't Gore that initiated that kind of a band. <laughs> uh, that was Jack. Yeah. Um, OK, Trent Lott. Um, so, so uh, in the early days, when, when, you, when you were there, and Jack was pushing tax cuts, not on the Ways and Means Committee, I asked this this morning but, and had others answer it, uh, he was not only uh, criticized by, by Democrats, I mean, Pat Moynihan said it was quackery, Kemperoff, um, but also Republicans didn't like what he was doing. What, tell, tell me about that. Well, I mean, it was a new and a different approach, and he was very aggressive about it. And Jack had, uh, he, you know, there were no areas where he was off limits. He'd, he'd get in everybody else's ter territory. He'd get in their turf. And, you know, you're right. He was not on Ways and Means co Committee. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, he'd get over into the budget area. Of course, he d did develop some, uh, some expertise in the defense area, as has been mentioned. But uh, yeah, there was there was uh, some real uh, Are jealousy. Are you in Chow Chowder and Marching? I'm in Chowder and Marching. In okay. fact, I'm in there because of Jack Kemp and Bill Archer. I mentioned both of them, and uh, we used to have some pretty raucous sessions there uh, too. Well, tell me about uh, that. What happened? Well, well, I, you know, I 
I'm not, I'm not sure how much we're supposed to talk about that, but uh, what you really do is talk about what's going on legislatively and politically, and Jack would always get things uh, kind of stirred up and then a little bit of an uproar, which he royally loved. Mm -hmm. you know, the, when the debate would really get going and get heated, he was just having a grand old, old time. But I do know that uh, sometime that uh, the senior Republicans on, on Ways and Means or the leadership uh, felt like Jack was, uh, you know, causing problems uh, by getting into areas where he really wasn't supposed to, based on his committee assignments and his expertise. Did well, you cover me, Ways and Means, John? <clears throat> and, and Jack used to, one of the senior Republicans on the Ways and Means Committee was Barbara Conable from upstate New York, or a district close to Jack. <clears throat> and, um, and, and Jack would sometimes talk about Kemp Rothy and say, you know, the problem with you is you're just a Conable sycophant. You believe everything. And he'd go on and talk about how Barbara Conable was yesterday. And then at the end he might ask me, why doesn't Barbara like me? <laughs> <laughs> and did, did Barbara not like him? No, I don't think Barbara Conable disliked him. I think he considered him a bit of a nuisance on that stuff because he wasn't on the committee, and that was the way. Like, what it was the way that was the way the House another, worked. Back another area, like on uh, budget, uh, you know, Jack made it clear. I mentioned it earlier. You referred to it as root canal politics. All that Republicans would talk about in the early '70s was how important you know the balanced budget was. Uh, which it was, and, and that's one area where I used to disagree with him, but he would, he'd get in the, the hair of, uh, of the budgeteers, too. Uh, uh, I think that some of the things he, that has been happening in Washington the last couple of years uh, in the budget area, he would not have liked uh, the idea of taking hostages. Well, he, he was I, not an advocate of cutting no. spending. He, no, he, that's, he, that's, he wanted that was to cut being tax gentle. Rates. He was not an advocate of cutting spending. He, but he gave me a hard time. He, he called me the Aldamata. Of, of the South because I was always getting earmarks, uh, thanks to Bob Livingston and others, for uh, road projects and so forth in Mississippi, and he, he royally enjoyed harassing me about it, which I was delighted because I was so proud of the earmarks that I got from my poor state. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I'm a little unclear still from this morning about the Amigos. Yeah. You were one of the Amigos. Yeah. When did the Amigos start? You know, I guess it would have been in the 90s. So it was uh, after. This when is when he was HUD secretary. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. It, it, and it, it, was, it was because, because it, it we was, met at, where was that place we met? The Mexican restaurant. The Mexican yeah. restaurant right there on the hill, right? Uh, uh, Rehashing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. All right. We so it's a, it's a 1990s thing. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I get it. Um, and you weren't and you weren't in the conservative opportunity society either. I was kind of on the fringes uh, in that. You were, uh, you, you were chicken. <laughs> no, <laughs> I was whip. And while I felt close to everybody in the conservative opportunity society, Ben and and uh, Newt and Connie and Bob Walker, uh, I was close to all of them. But I also felt uh, a need to uh, to sort of be a go between between that group and. Uh, Bob Michael and the Republican leadership. So I, I, that was kind of a role that um, I assumed, whether I, I don't know if anybody told me to do it, but I thought that I, I was attracted to what they were doing, the name, they were all my cl the closest friends. I, I felt close to the revolutionaries, but I also felt it was very important that we not undermine the leadership, uh, even if you didn't agree with the leadership. And quite frankly, that's one reason why I decided in 1988 it was time for me to make a move because I'd been uh, whipped for eight years and it was getting to be very uncomfortable uh, in that role and I figured it was time to make a move one way or the other. So was Newt going after the leadership already? At, in, well, in the you know, it, it, uh, I didn't, I think he was giving the leadership a little bit of a hard time already, but I don't know that he had, a, 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 you know, plans or a vision that he was going to be in the leadership. I mean, he had between him and leadership was, uh, you know, Dick Cheney and, and Trent Lott uh, in the leadership. But then when I left uh, as whip, uh, Dick Cheney took my place and tells me to this day, hey, I, did, I was a better whip than you were. I never lost a vote. A, a of course, it was because a month later he was Secretary of Defense. But then, <laughs> of course, Newt did take his place uh, in uh, and that would have been in uh, 89, 80, 89. And, uh, and one by one vote. Because uh, he had a good vote counter. He, well, you the vote counter. <laughs> but uh, then I do think that there was a, you know, he did see then the opportunity to perhaps be the, uh, yeah. the Re minority leader that, and the speaker. Remember that Newt took credit, I, you would know if this is accurate, Newt took credit for driving John Rhodes out of the leadership. 
He told all of us that. when I, I wasn't here when Rhodes was leader, but he took credit for having done things that convinced Rhodes that he should step down as leader. So, so what, he, he what, what year some, would that have been? He, he, he didn't run for leader again. And John Rhodes was still in the Congress in 1980, but didn't run for leader again. Yeah. And I think it, you know, there was some accuracy to so, that. So now, but, but Kemp was not, was Kemp in the conservative opportunity? No. I don't know he wasn't. No. no, he played a, a role quite similar to yours. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. So how would you characterize, I mean, Newt Gingrich is obviously busy, we'll interview Newt at some point, but what was the relationship like between Jack and, and Newt? Well, from, I, I, from the beginning, and then as, as I, I think there was a, I think there was tension between the two of them. Why um, tension? Because um, they were both idea men, uh, both very strong personalities, um, both um, um, uh, capable leaders, and so there was there's, there was that constant tension. Um, that would be my actually. I, I felt like that we needed them both at the time. Jack was the guy that had, uh, I thought, uh, the ideas that we needed to go with and the vision. Uh, Newt he was, was the teacher. He, he was the revolutionary, but he was also the professor. He was the one that, uh, you know, uh, started getting us to use different language and, and kept developed the actual we, words we used. But still, uh, the, the spiritual leader was, was Jack. Mm -hmm. I, I, th I think that Jack, I think it would be fair to say Jack probably saw Newt as too tactical and too divisive, and it, well, that's not who he was. I can even be defend being tactical and divisive as a practical politician, but it was not Jack Kemp. He didn't want to divide the country, and he didn't want to focus on narrow tactics. He wanted the big vision that would unite the country and move the party forward, and he didn't see Newt in that, in that way. I have to say, having said all that, when, when Newt never was, Newt was always a Kemp for president guy. There was no courting that had to go on. There was, he didn't have to be persuaded of it. He understood that, that the guy that could lead us to the promised land was Jack Kemp. Right. More, the other thing that I just, from my perspective, uh, Jack did not like negative politics. No. I mean, one of the reasons he was so poor in those debates was because people who do well in debates are people who not only can frame their own arguments, but know how to undercut the other person's. I mean, yeah. that's just the history of debates. And Jack was terrible at that, and that's not, he didn't like it. And he didn't like people who, yeah. it wasn't that, I mean, you know, it wasn't that he was St. Francis of Assisi all the time, but, it, but he didn't like people who he thought trafficked in that, and I think he felt to some extent new trafficked in that. Yeah, I have to relate a, an anecdote. This is from 96. I know we're not supposed to go there, but I mentioned No, we're going to go to 96. <laughs> um, one of, the more, one of the more, my more painful conversations ever was toward the end of the 96 campaign, and Elizabeth Dole called me up. And Mrs. Dole said, we're, we're getting killed out there, Vin. No one is attacking Clinton. The vice presidential candidate is supposed to be the attack dog. And people tell me that you, Vin Weber, are the guy that can convince Jack Kemp to go on the attack against Clinton. And I had to say, uh, Ms. Ms. Dole, it is just not in his constitution to do that. Right. I said, even if I could talk him into doing it strategically, he won't pull it off because it's just not who he is. So I, this, is, this is something that I cannot quite get, get my, my head around. <clears throat> Here he is, professional quarterback, football player, in the most uh, violent sport in America. And he's a competitor. He likes to win. And yet, when it comes to hitting somebody, he won't hit. How do you explain that? He was a quarterback. He was a quarterback. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't hit anybody. They, they inspire the team. They hand the ball off to the running back. They throw to the big tight end. I mean, that was that was Jack's politics. Uh, it was the same as his it was, it was uh, football. Somebody, it was somebody else's responsibility to do the blocking and the tackling. Yeah, that's right. right. And and he and he was a quarterback. I mean, he was a team rallier, and Boy. all of all of the characteristics of, of a quarterback is who Jack Kemp was. And I was just thinking about a conversation I had with Ben there earlier and, uh, about that I thought Jack did not vote for that 1986 tax reform package, but, but Ben did. says when it came back from conference, he did. And I think I remember why. We did something which I uh, did not agree with and argued passionately with him uh, over it, uh, was we exempted, I think it was 10 million people. Yes. Uh, from paying income taxes. 
Uh, and of course now that number is up to uh, 40 something percent. I thought everybody should have to pay some. Jack, again, typically a Jack wanting to think about uh, the low income and, and, you know, and minorities and the, 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 the burden that the income taxes had on them. I think that was one of the things that uh, may have caused him to come around. I remember because, you talking about that well, at the Well, I did not like that uh, at all, and, uh, but it, we, he prevailed. Um, what you, you recall one, one incident uh, uh, when Kemp, although a leader, was, was operating against Reagan on 82 and 83 uh, tax increases, and he was also, he called for Volcker to not to be reappointed to the, to the, to the Fed. I mean, he, he, and as Fred recalls, he, in the Reagan diaries, he's regarded as, uh, as unreasonable, and, and there was, there's a whole lot of, of stuff, clips, of how he was being ragged on by the White House staff for disloyalty and, and stuff like that. Do you remember? Oh yeah, yeah. That, and and that he, not only that, he influenced some of the rest of us to to join him, and then we wound up, uh, you know, getting uh, winding up in the, the uh, in the woodshed uh, at the White House. I did it more than once. Uh, Jim Baker used to get on my case, and usually it was because Jack had had me <laughs> take up one of his causes. But no, he. He, he, he didn't, I don't think he ever met a tax increase that he, he thought was a, a, the right thing to do and always thought it was wrong. I wonder, I don't remember how he voted on when Drew Lewis, Secretary of Transportation, showed up and convinced us to vote for uh, an increase in gas fees, not taxes. I wonder, <laughs> I can't remember how he voted on that, but I wouldn't be surprised if he voted against <laughs> that too. Um, okay. Uh, do you remember any of that stuff? When when I, I, Ed Meese says it was Jim Baker who was leaking this nasty stuff against against Jack Kemp because Jack Kemp was off the reservation. Oh, I think Jack. Yeah, I think there was some of that to be sure. And Jack, I, I think there was a I love hate as a cliche, but but I think Jack with, was both what I said earlier a formidable figure within the Reagan White House when they looked at Congress, and also he was a pain in the neck sometimes. And I think Jim, <laughs> Jim Baker loved things to be tidy and, and loved things to work, and Jack, wasn't, Jack didn't do tidy. Uh, and, and so I think both those, I think those coexisted. I don't think the White House, I don't think Reagan or that White House viewed Jack as an enemy. They just viewed him as sometimes a, a burr that would be, yeah. that wouldn't go along. Okay, I have to ask you, what was the relationship like between, I know the answer, between Jack Kemp and Bob Dole. <laughs> I mean, Rick, uh, Hedrick Smith writes in The Power Game that they hated each other. Um, is that fair? Well, you're asking Ben that question. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm yeah. asking you too. I'm trying to remember. I remember one time. It, it, was, it, was, partic it was vicious for a while, but I don't think permanently. I remember I was over messing around in this, on the Senate side for something. Maybe, maybe it was a conference. And as I recall, it was Tom Carlogas, who was very close to Dole. Bob Dole, referred to the, something like the menace from the house. And I said, yeah, they're small fish, but they're piranhas. Uh, but uh, yeah, there, was, there were some, some, some shots fired back and forth uh, from, the, from, from Bob and from the Senate over to the, to the house. Was Sometime all, merited, by the way. <laughs> it, was, it was largely about deficits, right? Or was it personal? Well, uh, can I, I I'll just, this is my, just my opinion, I can't prove mm -hmm. it. I think that the problem with, with Dole and Kemp in those days was that with Kemp it was a very serious ideological argument. And Dole didn't quite get that it wasn't personal. Because everything was very personal to Bob Dole. But it wasn't personal with Jack. I don't think he hated Dole. And he certainly liked him in 1996, got along very well. But <clears throat> he, he was passionate about the issues and Dole was standing in the way of us on taxes, and that's what Jack cared about. But it wasn't personal on his part, I don't think. I Fred, never, I Fred, never, heard, I never heard him say anything bad about Bob Dole personally, ever. Yeah, don't confuse Jack Kemp with Newt Gingrich, right, right. you know, yeah. who referred to uh, Dole as the tax collector for the welfare state. Right. So, I, Can very you guys think of anyone that Jack Kemp hated? Mm. Okay. I can think of I can think of a lot of people I hated. I can think of a lot of people most people. I can't think of anyone that Jack Kemp really hated. Um, okay, let's let's go, let's go to foreign policy. Uh, was Kemp? Would you regard Kemp as a neoconservative? He tied the tax increases. Between me. Yeah. Completely changed the He was a neoconservative at the time. I'll respond from a little different perspective. 
because one of my post-congressional things was I, I chaired the National Endowment for Democracy for eight years. And in 1980, when, we, when we authorized the National Endowment for Democracy in 1983, it was divisive on the Republican side. A lot of good friends like uh, Judd Gregg and Hank Brown and others on the right were against it at that time. And I didn't know what I thought. Uh, but Jack was passionate about supporting it because he believed spreading the American idea was part of what we should be all about. And that would today be kind of described as neoconish. In, in Jack's post, after the 96 election, or after, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, basically, Jack became very non-interventionist in terms of the military, his, his approach to military spending and military interventions. Some almost thought he became a pacifist, which was not when, true. When but was this now? After, after the fall of the Berlin Wall. He doesn't, I, he, I, so others may know more, but I know he didn't like anything we were doing in the Middle East. He really didn't want to see us doing a lot of military interventions. But when it came to the notion of spreading the idea uh, of democracy, of democratic capitalism, of, uh, he, he really believed it was a universal idea and that we should be doing what we can to spread it as a country. Yeah, he, uh, it wasn't just the Middle East, it was in uh, Kosovo. Or, uh, yeah, no, you're right, you're right. He was opposed to that. What are you going to do? What's the message we're sending to all the Muslims of the world? We're bombing them? Is that, is that our response? Is that our attitude? Is that our approach? Yeah, he was pretty I, consistent. I had dinner one night with, uh, with Bob Novak and Jack Kemp and a couple others. And, and, you know, Kemp, uh, Novak became, you know, really a, a, after the fall of the Berlin Wall II became, I, Bob almost was a pacifist, he'd hate right. that term, but I mean, he was opposed to almost all military action. And he and Jack were remarkably close on that. At the same time, they were, they were totally apart on the question of Israel. Jack was a, I think, a really quite sincere, devout supporter of Israel. And he was, he was the other, one of the other hallmarks of the neocon movement was to promote uh, uh, in a very aggressive way democracy. And it's been said there was no greater advocate. So he, he, he couldn't be, I don't think he could be categorized as simply as a neocon or a non-neocon. Uh, Fred just reminded me of a, uh, another experience I had with, with Jack, but another area first where he influenced my thinking and probably a lot of other people too. When I, I came uh, to Washington uh, from a uh, small blue collar community, my dad had been a shipyard worker, I was, a, uh, I guess, a basic protectionist. Jack was an avid free trader. And uh, over the years, we went round and round and round about that uh, with, the, with me losing ground to him every time. And, uh, and he, you know, and he, he finally came up with a line, you know, he put uh, free trade in the same category as uh, uh, free enterprise and freedom. And uh, really caused me to do some reading and thinking about it. And then eventually, uh, when I went to the Senate, I voted for every free trade agreement we had. And, and politically, in his district, he could easily go the other way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, I remember in 19, uh, this is what Fred reminded me of, in, in 1984, uh, the platform uh, con uh, at the convention, uh, we had a lot of fun. Jack was uh, involved, and uh, we had a pretty good little tussle with uh, people like Carol Campbell, who uh, di didn't uh, like the, it was the textile issue. It was important to say free and fair trade. Well, it was a pretty good uh, little tussle went on with that. But the best part of it was the White House had set it up to make sure that that platform said what they wanted to say. And Jim Baker had sent in John Bolton to make sure that, and Drew Lewis, to come in and make sure that platform said what they wanted to say. Well, in the end, it said every word that Jack Kemp wanted it to say, except for that word free and fair trade, including even inserting a, 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 a very carefully comma. placed comma. I remember that. That changed, <laughs> remember that, too. that changed the whole content of the, the platform with That's regard funny. to tax policy. And then we put a bow on it and handed it to uh, Drew Lewis to give to uh, the White House. So, and what, uh, what kind of, the, the comment, it, it said, uh, we oppose tax increases, comma, which will hurt diminish, economic, diminish growth. economic growth. <laughs> but that's not what they wanted. They didn't yeah. want the comma. They, right. Yep. You know. And the comma became the story. But we, we, uh, Jack we, had a blast on it. Were you on that platform? I was on the platform. Yeah. We threatened to take that comma to the floor to the convention. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we really would have. But, <laughs> but Jack also had some great staff. Uh, that's where I got to know Dave Hoppy, that wound up being my chief of staff when I was a leader. And he, somebody mentioned John Mueller. But he, he was a magnet for talented people, both when he was in the house and at HUD everywhere he went. Uh, he inspired people and he attracted uh, very capable people to help him get his job done. Yeah, maybe just one point. On that, yeah. on that uh, matter of the comma, you had not told the White House that this is what you were going to do, and it wasn't shocking. It was a, just a little grammatical uh, uh, thing there. <laughs> yeah, but it changed the whole meaning, of course. Well, yes, it did.
Surprise surprised the White House. Uh, yeah. Say more. Yep. Yeah, again, back to the um, um, foreign policy aspect. Uh, the other thing that he did, and I mentioned this this morning, is that um, he would really kind of seek out the new members that uh, had come in sure. that uh, hadn't really been exposed to a lot of these different issues, like the endowment, um, and convince them that this is the right thing to do. And again, he had the stature uh, to do it, that people, um, uh, particularly new members that, coming right? in, they yeah. had great respect for <laughs> Jack and his, uh, his ideas. And so, I can, again, I can remember many times when he would come up to me uh, as, a, as a new member of the Congress and say, well, what are you, what are you thinking about this? And of course, I was, first reaction, well, I'm not sure I want to tell you because I'm not sure I want to hear what you have to say, but it, he, would, he would force it on you. And uh, he was, I thought, he was incredibly helpful. He was a great mentor. Um, so does, is, it, is it Reagan's influence on him, or did he have influence on Reagan on issues like SDI and defense spending and the Contras and opposition to the Soviet Union and the Reagan doctrine, all of that? How, how, what was the byplay between him and Ronald Reagan? Well, in the first instance, I think Jack had an influence on him to make that one of the three big issues in the, uh, in the uh, 80 campaign, to make defense. Remember, we, we felt like defense had been gutted. That was one of, I think, one of his three big issues. And that, again, there was, there was a group that pushed that, but Jack clearly uh, was one that, that, that did that. But I think as you went on into the years uh, on things like Iran-Contra and some of the others, he probably was influenced by the, the, the Reagan team, uh, even though he you know, probably was you know, not, not hard to, con to convince. But I don't think he was pushing it on them. I think they were... Uh, convinced of the rightness of what they're trying to do, and he was supportive. Let's revisit for just a second, though, one of the issues you raised this morning, and that was the impact that Jack had on the Reagan administration on the emigration of Jews from the Soviet Union, because that was not a foregone conclusion. I was involved in some of those meetings where we had to talk George Shultz and others into taking a more aggressive stance on that issue. Max Campbellman told me a couple of years ago that he believed that the Reagan administration's efforts in that area saved a million lives. And Jack Kemp is a big part of that. Um, I mean, he was in favor of funding SDI. He, he wanted, at one point, he said he wanted SDI deployed by 1996 and was constantly pushing uh, increases in the appropriation. Do you remember any of that? I just remember there was a joint effort. There were several of us that were, were pushing uh, uh, SDI, Dr. Teller, and, come down and, and, and given a speech to us. Uh, Newt was uh, heavily involved in that and, and, and uh, Jack was as well. Uh, but uh, the appropriations, the Republicans, particularly the younger Republicans on the Appropriations Committee were very pro-defense. We, we, we kind of acted as a team. And both uh, uh, within the committee and then on the Intelligence Committee, which I served on for six years, uh, we, were, we were constantly pushing the envelope for SDI, for brilliant pebbles, for all of the accoutrements that the, that the system offered. And, of course, it uh, ultimately uh, uh, became the, uh, the catalyst for the collapse of the Soviet well, Union. So I think, was in retrospect, it was the right thing, thing to do. Came from, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the idea of missile defense. So Reagan had written about it yeah. in, in his uh, radio talks in the, in the late 70s. Yeah. So I think it, it, he initiated it. Right. Okay. Um, he, on the the areas where he differed with with Reagan, one of them was uh, weapons to uh, AWACS, for example, to Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, how how did the how did the White House react to that kind of opposition on the foreign policy front? Remember any of that? I remember AWACS very well, but it was such a Senate fight yeah, that I, was I, that say, I that just, was strictly uh, in, yeah. in the Senate and. Uh, and I don't, I don't remember Jack playing a role in that or the White House reacting to Jack because it was all Senate. Okay. Uh, um, th so there's other issues that, uh, that are disagreed, especially with George Shultz on um, funding for solidarity. Anybody involved in that one? Um, funding for the Angola rebels. No? <laughs> he, no he, what was Jack's position? He was, he was for, to that? He was oh, for so, yeah. funding Savimbi yeah. and uh, Savimbi and. Uh, and uh, Schultz was not. So there were yeah, many things that Jack them. wasn't for funding. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, didn't, they ultimately funded. Oh yeah, oh, I yeah. think they. I think they ultimately <laughs> did. So in 1986, he says in an interview that Schultz should be replaced by Gene Kirkpatrick, and then in 1987, he actually get a CPAC speech called for Schultz's resignation. Um, I take it. I don't know whether this was part of the campaign. 
you know, the lead up to the campaign, that he wanted to distinguish himself from, uh, from George Bush, or what? Yeah, I, I don't have any insight on it. I, okay. well, I, 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 we had a lot of arguments with Schultz about, it, it wasn't just Angola, but we were, we were trying to get funding in Cambodia and Afghanistan and Angola and a couple other places too. Schultz was resistant on that. He, we, were, we were insistent that every time we negotiated anything with the Soviet Union, we'd bring up Jewish immigration. Schultz didn't like the restrictions that put on him. And uh, I, you know, I think in retrospect, we were way too tough on George Schultz, who I think was a great Secretary of State. But we had these arguments with him, and Gene was our hero, her heroine. We were the course to Jack on Volcker, a lot of us. Uh, yeah. uh, felt like Volcker was driving us over the cliff. And uh, I probably was one of the ones that uh, joined Jack and, <laughs> and called for his removal. And uh, I because, remember- Because tight money was uh, creating recession. Absolutely, which, yeah. But, but if Jack, we haven't gotten into gold at all, but if, if there had been a gold standard in, in, uh, in 1980, 81, you would have had a, a contraction. You would have had a recession, wouldn't you? Because there would have been tight money instead of loose money. And uh, well, I you think we'd have the need same Jack. Result. That's what stock. No, that's Jack would have to be we'll explained. John, 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 we'll get John. We'll, get John <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about it later. John. Okay. Um, okay. Um, Jack, by the way, uh, he was he, he wanted Volcker replaced. He wasn't terribly pleased with the replacement. He was not a huge Greenspan fan. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Okay, I want to ask uh, Bob Livingston something because you were you were on foreign ops with him. And tell me about the, the fights with Obi over, David Obi, that later became chairman, over the IMF and the World Bank and that sort of thing. Obi wanted to take the money and give it to the UN and to the IMF and to the, all the international banks and Jack was dead set against it. I didn't know, when I came on the committee, I didn't know anything about those organizations. I learned at Jack's knee. I, I listened to enough of his speeches and I became absolutely convinced he was right. Uh, but uh, but Obi, uh, to his, uh, until the time he retired, uh, was pushing those institutions, no matter how much proof we gave to him, that they didn't work and that they were wasting money. And he just would and, 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 and destroying economies. I, IMF to this day has a terrible record of, of saving our, uh, economies. But uh, it was the multilateral banks versus uh, keeping the money in America and, and doing bilateral transactions with countries. And Jack was consistent from the day that I got on the committee to the time that he got off. It was also uh, an extension advocating of advocating that. It was an extension of his basic economic theory. Remember, one of his big arguments, particularly with the IMF, was that they would go in to save a country and impose higher, higher taxes, taxes and austerity measures. Right. And he thought it was ridiculous to punish poor people for being poor people. So it, it was really of, of one cloth with what he believed about economics in this country. He was not a person that wanted to punish people, to force people to make sacrifices that would make their lives more difficult. He wanted everybody to get richer. And he took that attitude to his uh, role as Secretary of HUD, of Housing and Urban Development, and, and, and brought out the, the HOPE program and all the other programs to promote poor people to have houses. And I, one of the unrelated, but related nonetheless, was a debate between Mike Espy, who had, had been totally uh, uh, convinced by Jack Kemp that, that to empower poor people to buy houses and, and to, to own them and, and to make something of themselves uh, in their own uh, independent right, and Maxine Waters, who clearly didn't buy that line of thought. And uh, so Mike Espy was championing Jack Kemp's HOPE program yeah. on the floor of the House, and Maxine Waters was debating him and crucifying him. Yeah. And I'll, I, I, if you go back to the debate, I'm sure you can find it in the congressional record, where uh, Mike uh, puts out all the reasons why poor people should own their home, own homes, and Maxine responds, but if they have their own homes when the roof uh, breaks, who's going to repair it? And Espy says, well, they are. <laughs> I can uh, vouch for the fact that uh, Mike uh, Espy of Mississippi, a congressman, uh, was a huge fan of Jack's. <clears throat> and I can also vouch for the fact that Hope Six uh, pro program worked magnificently. I was familiar with two of them in my own state, Biloxi and Meridian. 
and they were fantastic projects, and they, they empowered some people and gave them a decent place to live. They were great. It's a great program. Okay, let's go to 1988. Um, so when, do, when, did the, when did the planning start for Jack to run for president in, in 1988? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> the plan, what? what are we talking about? <laughs> well, what? <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> Vin? Boy, I don't know the answer to that, Mark. I mean, a, 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 a group of us had assumed this was going to happen probably for eight years. And I, I, but Jack didn't confirm that to, to all. He didn't say, I'm going to run for president after Reagan's done. But a bunch of us just assumed I mean, it's like I told you about this, this group of staffers back in 1975. Said, That's our leader after Reagan. I just always assumed that Jack was going to run for president after, uh, after Reagan left office. Yeah. But when the planning actually began, I'm not quite sure. So, Mort, 19, 1984, uh, convention, Dallas? Or, Dallas. or, or New Orleans? Yes, Dallas. 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 1984, I've been in uh, politics two years. Um, um, Bryant Gumbel is uh, interviewing me at, at the convention uh, with Paul Tribble. And uh, the last question he asked us is, well, who are you going to support for president in 1988? Now, mind you, this is 1984 convention. Paul Tribble, of course, having been around for a while, he said, we're so fortunate as a party to have so many good qualified uh, leaders that blah, 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 blah. Of course, he turns to me and asks me, and I said, Jack Kemp. So I don't know when the planning started, but as far as I was concerned, in 1984 at the convention, I believe Jack Kemp was going to be running for president, and I was going to support him. I mean, there were polls at that convention, straw polls, that indicated I think Kemp was second to Bush, right? And Dole was in there someplace. And I don't remember that. Anyway, so, so what are your outstanding memories of that campaign? <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, Pat Robertson is an outstanding memory of that campaign. Um, no, I just, it, it was... I guess my, one of my most outstanding memories really was at the end of the campaign that Jack really wanted to go back, and you, might, you guys were probably all there, but I had to organize an event in the Cannon Caucus Room because he wanted to get out of the race in front of his House colleagues that, were, that had been through, through the whole campaign with him. And I just thought, and I, 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 the campaign itself, of course, has a lot of memories too, but that, I remember that very much at the end that Jack was, as other people have said here, very loyal to his friends. There was, he, he had a sense, which we all tried to convince him was not true, that he had let us down, but he, and which he didn't. But uh, he, was, he was very sensitive to that, and he wanted to go out uh, and, and, and speaking to people in the House of Representatives about it. Um, so he, he, how many House members did he have with him? <sighs> Boy. I, I read somewhere two dozen. Is that? You know, I think oh, it would have been more than that. More? more than I that. would think so, sure. Yeah. I was the... Uh, campaign chairman for uh, for Florida. You, you ask about and your comment about the planning. <laughs> I mean, they're just we just never got organized. There just was no sense of direction, and and it, it just never it never caught on. And I don't, you know, I'm not quite sure why that was the case. Maybe again, just because there wasn't any real organization. But the the main thing I remember is that the Bush family always remembered. Boy, oh, did. Yeah, right. okay. <laughs> that I was for guilt. <laughs> Tell us about that. <laughs> oh, well, I, I remember I, I got a call from the vice president uh, uh, expressing his uh, <clears throat> disappointment uh, very plainly that I had endorsed Jack. And uh, I, I think I even got a, uh, along the way, I had a few uh, discussions with uh, George W. too, but of course, uh, so he finally got over it, <laughs> <laughs> I think. Well, in my case... Um, um, but it was a case, look, there wasn't any, there wasn't any choice. I mean, there's some things that uh, you do uh, for a person that you have admired and believe in it, you're close to it. What did I was against anybody? I was just for Jack. And that would have been what Jack would have wanted it. Yeah. So in my case, um, I, I, again, having announced to the world in 1984 that I was supporting Jack Hemp for president in 88, I still got this call from uh, uh, from uh, Bush to come down and have uh, breakfast with him, and I, I frankly was surprised that he raised it because I'd already come out. And he said, "Well, I've, I want your support in, in the '88 race," and I had to say to him, "Look, at, I've, I've already announced, you know, for, for Jack Kemp." And uh, um, as as people have said, they don't forget that. I mean, I, I remember having <laughs> having won uh, the race in 1988 uh, for the Senate. And uh, the first time that the Bush uh, team 
President Bush was in the state of Florida, I was left standing out in the, uh, with, the, with, the, with the cars waiting for them to come out in some event in Orlando. I mean, they eventually came and rescued me, but it was, it was a pretty kind of a, a good the shot. there. Yeah. And I was running for governor in 1987, and um, at that point, George H.W. Uh, Bush was running, but so was Bob Dole uh, for, uh, for the nomination. And I, early in the campaign, had come out for Jack Kemp. And both those guys came into Louisiana to, to campaign, uh, uh, but uh, they were more interested in drawing money out for their presidential campaigns than they were for raising money for my gubernatorial race. And uh, they both uh, came down pretty hard on me. <laughs> and uh, both of them, I think, at the time only made one appearance in Louisiana uh, that year. So. Um you said the, uh, the the campaign was the, was was the campaign disorganized at the top level, the Charlie Black, Ed Rollins um, level, or or what, what? What? Why didn't it congeal? I, you know, maybe Ben could respond better to, uh, to that than I could. I, I was not involved at that level, so I suspect it was because uh, it was hard to get Jack to organize, uh, you know, and and plan in the way that you have to when you're. Uh, you know, you're running a presidential campaign. It's yeah, a long, it's a big leap from being even a leader in the House, but from being a congressman uh, to, to running for president. I mean, the amount of money, the amount of uh, planning and organization uh, is just uh, so overwhelming. We see what's going on now. Yeah, ask the folks who have been in this race. Yeah. And, and, and more <laughs> again, from, from, from my perspective um, in Florida, there just wasn't any communication. I mean, so I don't think you can blame you know, that on Jack, that the, the organization did not communicate to the people on the ground what we were supposed to be doing. And uh, at least that's my memory of it anyway. Uh, what do you remember from that? Uh, well, first of all, it taught me a lot about presidential politics because I really thought Jack, I, I guess I thought he was going to be the nominee, but at least I thought he would be a heck, he had a heck of a shot. Because I thought after eight years of Reagan, you couldn't just say we want four more years after eight years. You can do that second term. And I thought Jack was enough of a, a link to Reagan, but also a fresh, different face and so interesting and compelling that it, it made a great deal of sense. And I thought neither Bush nor Dole had that. But, but what I, I should have known by then, because I covered enough, but I learned is that, boy, it is A, as people said, a tough business, and B, you got to be disciplined. And Jack just had no discipline whatsoever. Connie, it may be that they didn't, I mean, Charlie Black, and, and, and Ed uh, know the business. They know how to communicate. I, my guess is they were so busy trying to manage that, that uh, uh, you know, freewheeling candidate that, um, that, that they just, there wasn't time for anything else. And there wasn't Jack, um, he didn't attack anybody. Uh, he just went and did his own thing. And I thought he did it. I, I always thought it was interesting and compelling. But you know what? If you were a voter in New Hampshire and Iowa, Jack just didn't connect. Jeff, did you? More to cover on your question, I was curious if you had one about kind of turning to the future. Which of the American idea principles that Jack campaigned for and championed make the most sense today, and how would you guys frame them for going forward? Is that a topic you might have been that is, about? Yeah, that, that is where I was going to finish up. I'll let you restate it. Okay, good. In well, your own time, but I was just, I just Maybe it's because of this organization, but I, I sense there's a Kemp's renaissance underway. I think there are a lot of, uh, when I look at what's happening in Washington now in the paralysis, without being critical of any individual, because I know how tough it is to be in those leadership uh, slots, I see the next generation, a, a lot of uh, people that uh, would be very attractive to the Kemp uh, mold. And I am talking about uh, John Thune and, and uh, John Barrasso and, and uh, uh, Senator Blunt uh, and Kevin McCarthy. <laughs> Whoa, oh, goodness oh. gracious, what was that? Light. Yeah. Light. Kevin McCarthy uh, in the House of Representatives. I think there's a whole, and, and, and you, you talked about Paul Ryan, but I think there's a whole number of them, House and Senate Republicans, who I see a lot of uh, Kemp-type potential in them. And I think that their approach to leadership when their turn comes will be very different from what you see now. So w what, what of the themes that Jack Kemp enunciated are resident today that, and should be resident today in the Republican Party? Well, the, the, the optimism and, and the, the uh, power of ideas. I mean, I, I know that there, there's a, a discussion going on now. I've, I've argued for years with, with House members, don't wait till you have a party nominee. Well, we didn't wait when Reagan was running. 
we had, a, we had some ideas that we conveyed to him. He took those ideas, uh, adopted them, made them his own, improved on them. Uh, I think they ought to be, uh, have a positive message in developing ideas right now so that the Republican nominee can take advantage of them rather than waiting all the way till September to develop a positive message. I also think, uh, this is a personal thing, I'm getting on my own soapbox here, but uh, to just, it, just to be against the President Obama is not enough. I guarantee you Kemp would say that's not enough. You can't run against somebody unless you're running for something. And I think there is a generation that's beginning to stir that and want to do that. And I think it's needed, not only for their political benefit, but for the good, the good of our country. I think, I, I just, I'm not happy as an American right now the way I see the legislative process and the polit political leadership working across well, the board. You used a word that's been a bad process. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 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 Jack believed in the power of debate, power of ideas, and, and, and power of persuasion. But he was willing to work through the process. Sure. And the process is broken right now. Well, um, I think um, I think that the the message that Jack um, expressed all through his uh, career that, uh, that President Reagan um, campaigned on and 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 um, his philosophy of government um, worked then and it would work now. I mean, yes, there are some things that are different, but the notion that you uh, the ideas that they came out with, they, they were able to communicate that they would change the lives of all Americans. Yeah. Um, that, that, uh, and I think, that, again, one of Jack's strengths was because he came from a district uh, in Buffalo where he saw what it was like for people uh, to have lost their jobs and to, and to see industries um, uh, decaying and, and, and no opportunity. Um, uh, our message, uh, and, and I, you know, Jack was always after me for, you know, the, the, the budget issues, always talking about cutting too much. Um, and I think, we, I think we have failed to see the other side of, of, uh, of, of the equation here. Yes, you, you, we need to control spending, but we have got to do something uh, on, the, on the tax side to stimulate growth. Growth will work. I mean, that, if, if Jack were here today, I'll, I'll guarantee you. Uh, that he'd be talking about growth, growth, growth. What do you have to do? Lower capital gains tax rates, what, lower marginal rates. But we have got to find a way to say that to people that they can understand their lives are going to improve as a result of doing that. Would, he, would, would, would American politics be as polarized as it is right now if Jack Kemp were around? Well, it takes two people to unpolarize them. And uh, I'm not sure that uh, we have people on, on either side that are, that are willing to... Uh, uh, and go back to the more positive era of, of debating and then going out for a drink afterwards or, 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 or at least getting to be social. Not that Jack went out for a drink with anybody, but he, uh, he, he wasn't opposed to being social and get along with people uh, regardless of, of their temperament or, or, or their philosophical persuasions. Uh, the whole era needs to be transformed, and, and I think that leaders of both parties today have to recognize that, and if we don't get... Uh, a suffi sufficient recognition so that we start working like we did together to, and to come together under the Constitution, then we need new leadership. Yeah, and, you know, the other thought that I had is, I don't know about you all, when you, when you watch these debates, these uh, presidential debates that are underway, and, and a question will come up and say, well, how are you going to, what is your plan for creating jobs? My reaction is pretty much most of those guys look like a deer in a headlight. They, they, they know there's some words that they should say, but I, I don't think they have a clue about how to do it. And somebody better get a clue between now uh, and November. I don't know how much impact it had, but he would be expounding passionately against the atmosphere we see now. And maybe uh, you two gentlemen are sort of, you know, you're journalists and historians in a way, too. I don't know who coined the phrase, but the phrase, uh, a rising tide lifts all boats, I will forever associate it. With Jack Kemp. Uh, it was actually John F. Kennedy. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. no one the other it JFK. Yeah. No one picked it up more than, than, Jack. than Jack Kemp. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. I think you all have described him. He was about can-do optimism. He yeah. was about hope. He was about opportunity. He was about civility. 
in, uh, in, in while, while, while being passionate. And I, you know, I know we're not supposed to just uh, you know, talk about St. Jack here, but I really believe that, that uh, I don't know how long it's going to take us to get through what we're going through now. I really believe my grandchildren someday will read about Jack Kemp and he will be an important figure because he did personify things that not, not very many uh, people were able to personify and he did it in such an extraordinary way, you know, his shortcomings and all. You know, Martha, things he couldn't change. I mean, he couldn't change the sorting out of voters. So you have one, an ideologically conservative party and, a, and an ideologically liberal party. Um, that was going to happen anyway. Uh, but I think uh, uh, Senator Mack had uh, the right idea. You know, what Jack Kemp had was one big idea. And I think Ronald Reagan had one big idea. More than the economy, it was about winning the Cold War. That was his big idea. And Jack had economic growth was his big idea. It was good for everybody in America. It was good for everybody in the world. Uh, and I love Paul Ryan, but he has many ideas. And, uh, and growth is only one of them. And he's the budget committee chairman, and, he, and that's all about uh, you know, doing something about entitlements. And, uh, and uh, it's not about growth, and, and he has to go out of his way, Paul Ryan does, to give uh, speeches about economic growth because they don't come naturally to the budget committee chairman. Uh, Jack Kemp didn't have that problem. <laughs> he could give speeches about that every day and, and did. But that, you know, it empowers you when you have this one big idea uh, that uh, well, it, but really it also, drives you. But it also, it, it gave people a sense of hope. Yeah. There was, a, there was a belief that was communicated that the world will be different if we do as I suggest. There will now, be jobs created. Okay, this is the this is the last question. I want to on that point. I want to see whether you all agree with what Alan Riskin said that this this morning that between Reagan and Kemp they changed the world. Uh, that that if it hadn't been for Jack Kemp, Reagan might not have been a supply sider. If the economy might not have grown, the defense budget budget might not have been increased to the extent that it did. The Soviet Union might not have fallen when it did, and that, that between Kemp and Reagan, history got made. Absolutely. No question about it. They were on both counts. Yeah. Anybody yeah. want to expound on that? Well, or I mean, I'll we'll leave it to it. Alan. <laughs> yeah, okay. You give a shot at we'll it. We agree with it. All right. Thank you all very much. This has okay. been a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank Martin. you. We we'll ask all the right and tough questions. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.